Professor Howard Williams brings you death and memory from the past and the present. It's Archeo Death. Hello, my name is Professor Howard Williams of the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Chester and I'm giving this presentation as uh, part of my delivery to a local history society, Holt Local History Society. Um, Holt, uh, just this side of the English border, I say this side because I live in Wales, but I'm at the University of Chester now. In fact, this is the first time I've done one of my uh, public talks at my in my office uh, back after the... Um, um, the, well, the ongoing disruption caused by the uh, the lockdown and uh, various things. I, um, because of this situation, I thought it'd be best to pre-record my presentation and then I will be able to use the, uh, the, the evening lecture time with Holt Local History Society on Thursday the 12th of November to actually have a conversation to answer any follow-up questions about my topic. So I'm going to pre-record, make them available on my YouTube channel, Archeodeath, and then um, for everyone to see, but then Holt Local History Society can ask me some follow-up questions. But anyone watching this video on YouTube, please drop your questions, your comments below about my topic, about what's like, and I will be happily happy to answer them as, as much as possible. Also be aware that I've got a series of videos um, out in the landscape that I've been, uh, um, I've been doing over the last few months during the lockdown at um, specific points along Watts Dyke, um, particularly in Wrexham Borough, close to where I live. So you can, you can actually follow up with this, this video with some further videos. Now, my topic for today, this evening, whenever you're watching this, is what's what's dyke? And this is a topic which I've not ever addressed directly head on through my um, my, my research, through my um, presentations. I haven't actually engaged with this topic. So what is what's dyke? Well, um, it's at a time when the pandemic is enhancing our nationalisms, it, at a time where we have um, anti-Welsh sentiment in our media, in our, in our mainstream media, as well as um, clear regulations against English movement into Wales and disputes between governments and local authorities. Um, this is a particularly sensitive topic and these 1,100 year old plus ancient border is, is surfacing alongside its larger neighbour, Offersdyke, in popular rhetoric. And so I think that uh, asking this question in 2020 is not as straightforward. What is Wattsdyke um, may refer to what it was in the 8th or 9th century, but it also might refer to what is Wattsdyke in today's world and how do we consider it within our contemporary society. And while Wattsdyke is perhaps a secondary or perhaps even hardly hits the radar at all compared with Offersdyke, it is another linear monument in the British landscape which has the potential to be um, exploited and deployed in modern discourse and rhetoric. And therefore I wanted to say that at the very start, before I start answering the question, to be, to be aware that actually what seems like a sleepy, um, rustic monument, an old ba a bank and ditch, um, has many connotations and associations with it. Now I wish to proceed uh, in two halves. First I'm going to answer the question by the archaeology of Wattsdyke and the history of archaeological investigation of this monument, which actually isn't too difficult because there's been very little, despite it being known for a long while. And then I'm going to move on and look at its heritage and public archaeology dimensions. In other words, the significance or the potential significance of Wattsdyke in today's world. So that'll be my two halves. So I might actually split them into two videos. This first half then is part one, what's dyke archaeology? What do we know about this monument? And I want to proceed by asking what, <laughs> where, when, who and, and, and why? following very much an approach that David Hill adopted in, a, in a, one of the publications I'm going to uh, um, consider in a little while. So what is Watts Dyke? Where is Watts Dyke? When was it built? Who built it? And, and then try to think about why it was built, something which um, 
is is perhaps not as, as straightforward as you might think. You build a big bank and ditch, it might seem to be self-evident, common sense why it was built. Well, it's not that easy, matey. There's a lot of different potential reasons why you'd build a bank and ditch, and I'm going to try and argue quite clearly that it was never and ever was a border monument, but it would have been a frontier work in a different sense, um, with economic, social, political and ideological dimensions to its construction and use. That's the that's where I'm going with this. This will be the first half. What is what Stike? Well, it is a huge bank and ditch. And this is the monument south of Erdig. Look, you're looking north here along the line of uh, what Stike. And you can see immediately a number of key features that we need to pay attention to. Uh, firstly, the fact that it is um, it is uh, damaged and denuded and that it is a monument that has here a modern farm gate running through it. Therefore, it is a, mon a monument that has been received long standing damage. And every time a farmer uses that gate for animals or for tractors, it's eroding the bank of an ancient earthwork. But it's not just simply a bank, and here the bank is of s substantial size, um, over two and a half metres to three metres tall here, and about four and a half, five metres in breadth, it, at least, uh, probably more than that. But it's also a huge ditch, and you can't see the ditch very well, but perhaps in the far distance on the horizon you can see that the ground drops down before it rises up to the bank. And that's because you're looking at a very denuded ditch on the western side of this bank. We don't have any demonstrable evidence for it having a counterscarp bank, in other words a western bank before the ditch, but it may well have once had one but eroded in almost everywhere that it might have, have survived. And if we're looking at analogies with other monuments, including Offa's Dyke, we might anticipate there were quarry ditches on the eastern side but the bank and ditch are what survive they survive in different scales in different places this is south of Erdig and here uh, Cecil Fox who can conducted the only systematic survey of of, of Watts Dyke as part of his broader work investigating Offa's Dyke he recorded a series of profiles across the monument at various locations and these are some examples and so we have a bank, and what's what's dyke is a huge bank and ditch. The bank up to three metres, the ditch up to three metres in depth, and the entire monument over ten, sometimes more, metres across. It depends on the topography it's sitting on, whether it's sitting on a, on a slope, on, a, on relatively flat ground, or indeed on a steep slope. It, it, its form changes, and that is the same as with Offa's dyke. So first answer is Wattsdyke is a bank and ditch. Now this monument was first recorded in Churchyard's Worthiness of Wales from 1587, where it says that within two miles there is of 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 Offa's Dyke that is, within two miles of each other, sorry I meant, there is a famous thing, called Offa's Dyke that reach far in length, all kind of where the Danes might thither bring. It was free ground and called the Britain strength. Wattsdyke likewise about the same was set, between which two both Danes and Britains met, and traffic still by passing bounds by slate, the one did take the other prisoners straight. In other words, in the 16th century context, we understand a recognition by antiquaries of the relationship between Offa's Dyke and Watts Dyke as paired monuments in this northern stretch of Wales, and between which the Danes and the Britons met, the Welsh and the English, I presume he, he means in traditional terms. And this monument, Watt, um, um, uh, the author of um, um, you know this, this monument may be alluded to as Offa's Dyke in earlier sources. Um, for example, the the Book of Basing work refers to Offa's Dyke as terminating between the monk's house of Denis Basing and Minith Iglo. Um, clearly, this is referring to Watts Dyke, but 
there seems to be a conflation and confusion of Offa's Dyke with Watts Dyke from the Middle Ages, which has very suggested to many scholars that maybe they were seen as equivalent or connected from a very early point. We were to wait till the early 19th century before anyone gave a proper description to the length of Watts Dyke, and that was Thomas Pennant writing in 1810. And the great dyke and foss called Watts is continued from each side of, the, of this post. This work is little known, with notwithstanding it is equal in depth, though not in extent, to that of Offer. We shall here trace the course of it. Watts can only be discovered to the southern part of Maysbury Mill in Oswestry Parish, where it is lost in morassy ground. From thence it takes a northerly direction to Hendinus, and by Pentraclough to Gaboin, the site of a small fort called Brinicasteth in the parish of Whittington, then crosses Priest Hen Henthley Common to the parish of St Martin, goes over the Kerriog between Brinicalt and Pontebleau Forge, and then the Dee River below Nantabella, from whence it passes through Winstay Park by another Pentracloith or township on the ditch, to Erthig, the seat of Philip York Esquire, where there is another strong fort on its course. From Erthig it goes over above Wrexham, near Melin Polston, to Doleth, Mysgwyn, Rosde, Croisenorus, Mr Shackley's Gwerseth, crosses the Allen and through the townships of Clyde to Rhythin in the town in the county of Flint, above which is Caer Esten, a British post from as a hill fort. From hence it runs by hope along the side of Molesdale, which it quits towards the lower part and turns to Minneth Sichten. Um Monoclog near Northup, by Northup Mills, Brynmoyle, Coidathlees, Nantaflint, um uh, Kevin Acoid, uh, um through the Strand Fields near Hollywell to its termination below the Abbey of Basingwork. I have been thus minute in giving its course because it is so often confounded with Offa's Dyke, which attends the former at unequal distances from 500 yards to 3 miles, till the latter is totally lost. So apart from my crap Welsh pronunciation, I hope that gives you a sense of the, the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, by the early 19th century, Pennant is aware um, as in, intimately familiar with this landscape, uh, in for particularly the northern stretch of Wattsdyke, um, he, he's aware of this difference um, between Offersdyke and Wattsdyke. But what is what? Well, it's thought traditionally to be a, a, a conversization of the the name Wade, uh, a Germanic hero. So the the um, the deed from 1431 spelled Cloud Wade. And in another year is Cloud Wode, and in the next survey, in 1620, is Cloud Wod. Um, so it, the argument is that what we're looking at, this is A. N. Palmer's argument, that um, we, we're looking at an emergence of a of an Anglo-Saxon uh, Germanic name, personal name, that is 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 is, a, is adapted or accumbricized into what? So what is is Wade? It's Wade Stike that we're referring to. Now, after Pennant, the first and only detailed survey to reach publication was that by Sir Cyril Fox, and he published it in the pages of um, Archaeologia Cambrensis, the Cambrian Archaeological Association's annual journal um, between the wars, um, and subsequently he included it in his Mag Mag in a magnificent Offers Dyke, a field survey, the Western Frontiers of Mercia in the 7th and 8th centuries AD, um, which came out in 1955 um, with the British Academy. And this is the only detailed survey. So I've, I've put up here um, some examples of um, his survey using the first additional Ordnance Survey 6-inch maps of using a black line to mark um, here north of, well, west of north of Parish, um, where it follows a, a detailed scarp. So north is to the left and then leaves the scarp and mine Clovog and uh, Sichten, and he sort of articulates the different levels of survival and, and, and hash, um, a hash line to make the point where it is less clear. And here, 
further south in the line of Watts Dyke, you have Fox's survey on the same six, six inch first edition ordnance survey map showing how the monument changes direction at strategic points and follows reasonably straight lines but you can see it's made up of smaller segments within that straight lines as it moves up a steep slope towards Pentraclyle Farm opposite Roabon. Roabon's down here. So this is the overall line that uh, Fox was able to chart and what's interesting about this is um, the the fact that it, uh, it, it is basically um, following a whole series of ravines and then jumping over high ground to connect up river systems and where it cannot be found Fox argued it was neither not needed or the, the the vegetation, the, the, the conditions were so um, so difficult to to chart. Um, here is Offa's Dyke. By comparison, we cannot chart it further north of Troythen since Fox's day, although there has been recent discussion that it may have continued parallel with Watts Dyke towards Prestatin, and Offa's Dyke runs down and gets closest to Watts Dyke near Ruaben, um, crosses the rivers differently, and Watts Dyke is to the east as follows to the confluence of the Clariogan D and goes jumps to Old Ossestry and down to Maysbury. And Fox in his survey was able to estimate an example shown here in the north um, the actual surveying strategy of Watts Dyke and he's able to argue that what we're looking at here is a a, a very carefully precisely surveyed monument that adapts to the local topography and has some long distance sight lines as it traverses um, bogs and woods and and open ground um, between the river systems and if I can clip to the next slide this is uh, Fox's survey of the southern sections of Watts Dyke um, showing it surveying surveyed into and developing from various key sightline points including Old Ossestry Hill Fort here to which we will return and you can see changing its alignment to follow strategically um, the particular layers of ground to keep low ground on its western side um, which it does in a way that Offers Dyke struggles to do in this northern section and that's a, a, a key distinction between the two monuments. So we rely a lot on Sir Cyril Fox's survey and he concluded his survey with some salient points that, that are, are important to, to read out to you. He saw it crossing 38 miles um, and running from um, the River Morder, a tributary of the Vunwy, uh, north over 38 miles to hit the D estuary. Um, of these 38 miles, five, 15 and one quarter, um, it follows rivers, and there's no evidence of the dike in those locations. Um, and it's a constructed frontier for 22 and three quarter miles. So he's saying where there's a river, they don't build the frontier. And rivers and ravines are utilised to uh, three points along the frontier, from the Nantiflin to the Allen, from the Allen to the D, and from the D to the Morder. So there's the three sort of sections of fairly equal length um, connecting up the monument. So now the, the so Fox concluded that the frontier um, was um, constructed by a series of positions and alignments that unlike Offers Dyke in this area was wholly in the lowlands and, and, and it just chosen with great skill um, to include a number of ravines to, to utilise as part of the frontier thus reducing the length of the artificial frontier line. Um, its course is chosen also to, to give good fields of view to the west using knolls and rising ground um, included in, the, in, in wherever possible and that it had a position of the frontier at the north end uh, shows the importance of the Mercians attached to the position, possession of the southern shores of the D estuary and the distance between Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke is never great and that the Offers Dyke is a frontier, a boundary rampart, not a line of defence. 
and I would suggest, well, I'll come on and suggest why that I don't agree entirely with that, um, but but that's that's his view, um, and that it was likely made like Oppenheimer by a man trained in the military in a military tradition. Okay, this character is that is uniform. Um, there were principles governing its alignment and construction similar to Offers Dyke. It differs in minor details of engineering technique to Offers Dyke. These suffice to reveal another intelligence controlling the work. These differences in technique are not such as to admit of a marked difference in date. The, the Dyke was never completed, he argued. The ramparts prevented uncontrolled access to the coastlines of the Dee between Flint and Basingwork through gaps in the natural frontier deep ravines. Uh, they were only begun. In its incompleteness it resembles Offa's Dyke. This incompleteness is related to the sparseness of effective occupation in the country. Um, the gradual, shown by the gradual diminution of agricultural land along the line of the dike as you go northward. So, particularly in the north, he's suggesting it wasn't um, really finished. And that the old name of Watts Dyke, Wade Wadders Dyke, may be a Mercian hero um, recording. So it's an honouring of a Mercian hero by giving it that name. And since Watts Dyke approximates in date to Offers Dyke, and since Offers Dyke is securely dated between 757 and 796, he argues, um, archaeologically speaking, and, ha and having regard for the point made in the preceding paragraph, we would go for 7 to 750 on one hand, uh, 800 to 850 on the other. So it's either side of Offers Dyke is what he's saying in terms of date. He then speculates it may have been built by Kings Pender and Wolfir or Ethelbold in, in the, so the, 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 the middle to late 7th century and Ethelbold in the early 8th. Um, or um, indeed it might have been a, a monument of one of um, Offers successors. And in terms of nomenclature, um, there was a confusion between Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke, already identified by Edwin Guest. And when the whole of the northern half of these dyke systems are plotted on a modern map, it is evident that Watts Dyke is, in this zone, much more reasonable frontier. And so what he's asked, suggesting is that um, there is a, it's, it's a much more superior or intelligent monument than offers. So Fox saw it as a monument of Ethelbold, most likely, um, just before Offers Dyke, uh, controlling the lower ground. And therefore Offers Dyke was a more elaborate, westerly, more aggressive or more up slope version of what Watts Dyke had already achieved. So Cecil Fox's work hit, hit, seem to be the conclusive demonstrable work and indeed um, it still gets used as the the point of reference in much of the archaeological literature um, and yet the Offers Dyke project by David Hill um, did put a lot of effort into looking at Watts Dyke so Frank Noble's work on Offers Dyke is not relevant to us no he didn't look at Watts Dyke um, and through the 1970s and 80s, though, David Hill and then David Hill and Margaret Worthington together did a tr a try to tackle both the monuments together. So these are redrawn maps from David Hill's contribution to the archaeology of Cloed, um, which is a late 90s book. Um, this is a, a co-edited by um, John Manley, Steve Grenter and Fiona Gale. And this book is no longer in print. Um, does um, contain a chapter, 1991, sorry, early 90s, 1991, does contain a chapter by David Hill, which has been recently republished in the Offers Dyke Journal. And in it, he does review field new field work of excavations at a series of sites along the Whitford Dyke, which he discounts as not relevant and not part of the Offers Dyke earthwork, and that David Hill has been proven right about. That, that wasn't an extension of Offers Dyke or Watts Dyke, it's irrelevant. 
um, works along offers dike, but also a series of points of intervention, relatively small-scale excavations, into Watts dike. And here in the northern section, his excavations, he argues, in this summary publication, prove that Fox was wrong on some regards, and that there, were, there aren't gaps. Wherever there was a gap, he was able to, or most often, he was able to identify you know, those gaps as resulting in later agriculture. So we have a monument that he argues is near continuous and that Fox didn't realise from the surface traces that excavations can reveal the monument as it runs along the tops of ridges. So here's one of the uh, published, uh, few published uh, sections of Watts Dyke by David Hill, um, which is redrawn, um, at least partially redrawn for the new republication of his article. And here, not a full geophysical survey published, but he at least is able to suggest that in an area where there is an, uh, there's been historically a gap in Watts Dyke, geophysical survey, the detailed results of which aren't published, but he claims that in a series of locations, the ditch and bank of the monument show up on geophysical surveys through these fields between Brinabal and New Brighton. Now, that's not a full report and it's not demonstrable evidence. And the problem is David Hill and Margaret Worthington didn't fully publish this material. <clears throat> so that we, this is a redraw of their, their, their map, from the, the David Hill map from 1991. But it does show that their sustained fieldwork was able to fill in gaps. And so that by the time of their 2003 book, Offers Dyke, A History and Guide, they only contain a, can incorporate a very small amount of work and discussion of Watts Dyke, indeed only over three pages, 161 to 163, um, they actually talk about the short dikes and um, and and, uh, and put that as a broader context, the row ditch. But ever so briefly they mention Watts Dyke too. So they say the Office Dyke project has excavated over 60 sites on Watts Dyke and has surveyed most of its length and has extended its length southwards for several kilometres. Um, it's much shorter than Offers Dyke. Um, prior to the work it was believed to be 20.75 miles in length, but now we can be sh show that it is at least 38.6 miles long, a spectacular achievement of field work and excavation, which they never published. Um, However, we must emphasise that Watts Dyke, Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke must run almost parallel to each other in the northern marches and they both face towards the west and our excavations have shown um, that both of the main constructional features in common from these observations it would seem likely they are roughly contemporary, perhaps within a century or two of each other. It's not exactly that contemporary, but okay. Thus the question of which of these two great earthworks is the earliest remains open. So they're not convinced, rightly, they're more sceptical of Fox's assertion and attribution to Ethelbold, um, but they don't have a solution for the relative dating of the two monuments. Now, the next piece of work of note is by Margaret Worthington, based on her Manchester M. Phil thesis, if I recall correctly, which is published in the Bulletin of the John Rylands Library in 1997, and has been largely ignored by scholars and which is a great shame because she does synthesize a lot of the field work um, she doesn't give any more published details of the profiles that she took or the excavations but she does assert further and argue further that this is the monument of what's like and it is a single linear monument and she also makes important observations about the relationship between high dated and unhigh dated manners at Doomsday, making the point that the line of Watts Dyke seems to have a continued significance in dividing between, not necessarily the Welsh and the English in an ethnic sense, but between different tenurial systems that were persisting through to the, um, in, in the late 11th century, between um, the, the, the Cheshire and uh, the Welsh uplands. So it, it, it's really interesting that even though she was working in a framework which thought Watts Dyke was earlier than Offers Dyke, actually she's hinting at evidence to suggest that if Offers, Watts Dyke was later, it, it had continued significance and Offers Dyke didn't, which is something that is, is intriguing. But the next major step in 
research, we've answered the where, the who, the what and the where. Um, the next question we have to answer is the when, and, and we really still don't have a clue until um, Tim Malam and Lawrence Hayes' publication in Anglo-Saxon Studies in Archaeology and History, Volume 15. There it is, edited by Sally Crawford and Helena Hamero. Uh, one of the most confused, uh, miscited pieces, because in the start of the journal, it says it's by Lawrence Hayes and Tim Malam, um, but on the paper itself it um it, it contradicts that and actually shows that it's made it's it's uh, authored the other way around by malam and hayes um it, so i cite it as malam and hayes but anyway that's the that's the root of why i keep seeing people citing it differently every time i i see it uh, cited it's because it's already in wrong you know there's been a reversal within the publication but their paper the date and nature of what's like a reassessment in the light of recent excavations at gaboan in shropshire looks at an area of excavation uh, where the monument itself is very denuded um, but they were able to take radiocarbon dates and um, optical stimulated luminescence dating of the monument and from the ground surfaces beneath the monument and they argued that this evidence together hinted at a construction phase for Watts Dyke that may be later, not earlier, than Offa's Dyke. And they made the argument that while the evidence allows the date of the monument to be fall from the 8th century through to the 10th century, that most likely we're looking at a late, uh, very end of the 8th or early 9th century date. And they speculate that maybe the Mercian King Cunwulf, the successor, long-term successor of, Merce, of, of Offa's in Mercia, the king of Mercia, Mercia may have built this as a frontier work against the Welsh, sort of reiterating or extending Offa's Dyke. Now, whether Offa's Dyke was still in use when that happened, whether these monuments were supposed to operate together um, or separately, are they consecutive or are they um, are they actually supposed to operate in tandem is, is still unclear. We also have evidence from Malam and Hayes' work, as elsewhere, that there may have been a stone revetment on the bank, um, that it may have looked, looked a lot more wall-like than it, it, uh, just a rough bank, and there were cobbles also, and a marker bank found beneath, so evidence of the construction process. The most recent work has not produced yet new dates for Offa's Dyke, but CPAT, Cluid Powers Archaeological Trust, have conducted excavations at Erthig Hall and Park, um, following on from earlier excavations. And the, the yellow and green, um, uh, the yellow is the ditch surviving, and the bank is in green, and you can see there's a counterscarp bank possibly at this lo these locations, although that, people can see that differently. But I'm here, this is the rookery. Um, and the bits of the bank survived. But there's also large sections here where there's been no um, discovery of the monument, where it's been eroded, that's in front of the hall. So we could either say, oh, well, there was never a monument there, or we can make the assumption that there was, because, and that it was landscaped out of existence when the hall was built. Well, here's the excavations, and what the excavations showed was that the bank survives even if there's no surface trace of it. So here you can see the surface ground is just a slight drop off. But the, um, uh, the excavations were able to find the traces of the bank and that the ditch was surviving to a monumental depth. So we've answered something about the what is what's dyke. It's an early medieval linear monument, presumably built by the Mercian kings against Welsh rivals. Where? Well, I've told you it runs from the Morther up to the, the estuary. Um, when? Well, we think it's now early 9th century in date, although it's dating, more dating is required, and maybe we'll see it as contemporary with Offa's Dyke, slightly earlier than Offa's Dyke, or indeed have it confirmed that it's later than Offa's Dyke. Who built it? Well, we then assume it's one of the Mercian kings, and King Cunwulf has been suggested as one option for that, but of course the, the date it maybe offers himself, uh, offer himself, who is offers monument to, but we don't know that for certain. Um, it seems most likely it's another king. Um, but why? And that's the question we need to address in more detail. So if we're looking at the broader why of Offa's Dyke, um, Watt's Dyke and Offa's Dyke, we have to understand them in relation to each other for first. 
first point, and we have to understand them in relation to a broader landscape zone. Uh, Tim Malam's very valuable map here puts the dikes on the uh, the map of Wales and uh, northwest England, the West Midlands, and uh, the southwest. And shows you the principal rivers and the principal Roman roads. Now, it doesn't mean that the Roman roads were still necessarily in use, but it does give you that sense of the broader arteries of communication. And it should be, you know, there's there's still a, a fiction out there that these monuments may have been built by the Romans, which is just, you know, absolute fantasy. And it's quite clear that these these don't respect or relate to Roman roads. In fact, they they cross them and block those arteries. Of communication and they block the rivers out of the Welsh uplands and we also have to understand it in relation to we have to understand these dikes as almost the the, the, the bones without the flesh the, the things that are ephemeral that would have been integral to a frontier zone that haven't survived that you would have necessarily defended the line of the monument but these are impedance markers that would have blocked and controlled visually movement through the landscape and they would have been supported we presume by beacons and watchtowers, and we have some Beacon Hill place names at Tut's Hill near down near um, near, near Chepstow, um, suggesting Anglo-Saxon names suggesting the lookout places. Um, we imagine there were gates, gateways through, and we imagine there would have been settlements and forts back from these linear earthworks, supplying them and supporting them, and perhaps even roads, tracks maintained carefully, um, set back from the line of the linear earthworks. And another key point I always make is that in building these monuments to make them visually commanding and controlling you'd have to do massive amounts of deforestation on the slopes immediately to the west so as well as the digging a bank and ditch there's a huge amount of additional work now uh, Brooks has created this sort of schematic to show you the contrast between a, a model of landscape organisation in the Mercian kingdom would have perhaps pursued with the linear earthworks of Offersdyke and Wattsdyke and how the West Saxon Kingdom may have used Wandsdyke by talking, see, showing a borderland zone west of the earthwork, uh, in this case, with communities that is being controlled. So it's not stop, it's simply a stop line against enemy territory that you would be controlling this landscape here to the west. And then, then the linear earthwork is it's called protection of livestock, but then you'd also have settlements to the east. Now I don't think that's entirely right but it's a it's a good way of simplifying and showing how this linear earthwork would have been about controlling people to the west and the east of this line as opposed to a defence in depth method of the uh, 10th 11th century with Alfred and Burrs against the Danes um, to control in depth. Um, but I would suggest that there is a mixture of the two in operation with these linear earthworks with perhaps the line of the monument having uh, points of defence and observation and control and gateways to control movement through it and also um, key strategic observation points to the west and the east of the line. But this at least makes the point about the why question of Wattsdyke is Wattsdyke in relation to Offersdyke may have been successive and may have worked together, but at least we think of them as successive, attempts to control this landscape. Its resources of lead, iron, um, its resources of wood, of people, of, of uh, and it, it, it reiterating a contested zone that was absolutely key for understanding control of the island of Britain. And in that last point, I want to show you this map I've constructed to try and emphasise that point. So here's Mercia, who we think are building these linear earthworks, the Mercian Kingdom of the English Midlands, um, with their sort of centre on Lichfield and Tamworth, um, but expanding their control in the 7th and early 8th centuries over a series of other peoples in what is to become Gloucestershire, Herefordshire, Worcestershire, um, Shropshire and Cheshire, this Western territory, the Magansata, the Rock and Sater are two of the names we have from the 8th century tribal hydage that, that might indicate sort of more localised communities and perhaps originally separate kingdoms. But they, they've taken over this area and, and, and this map, by putting Britain, the island of Britain, side on, it helps us to conceptualise how Arthur's Dyke and Watts Dyke together and successively could have worked to control not only riverine routes, into the Kingdom of Mercia, but also seaways 
out into the Irish Sea and the Bristol Channel. Because while these look like they're landward facing monuments, they are actually about controlling the D estuary, about controlling the Severn estuary and the Y River. So these are monuments that are as much about seascapes and riverine and maritime perspectives. And it's, this is not only about control of those landscapes, it's about audiences of communication, because as well as facing off against the Welsh kingdoms, perhaps of Gwynedd and Powys in particular, Brekeniog, Ergin, Gwent, Glwysing, uh, we, we have to think about these monuments as facing the main arteries of communication that would project power and influence, trade and contact across the Atlantic seaboard to Ireland, to Cornwall, to West Wales, to Northwest Wales, to Man, to Southwest Scotland, you know, to um, Northumbria's Western Territory, Cumbria and Northumbria. In that regard, while these almost every academic has conceptualised these monuments as against the Welsh, because that's what Asser in his Life of Alfred the Great tells us, offer built a monument against the Welsh, I think we have to consider them in relation to this broader backdrop, this broader tapestry of, um, of, of relationships, economic, social, political, with the British and Irish kingdoms. Bearing in mind that Mercia itself was a its name defines themselves as the people of the border who were actually comprised of a range of British and Germanic speaking Anglo Saxon peoples. It was not they were not an ethnically Anglo Saxon people. We imagine many of the Huicha and the Mackensata and the Rockensata and also the Pexata um, would have been people of the peak, would have been of, 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 of mixed at least mixed British and Anglo Saxon ancestry. That would have been played out on local community scales and regional networks of power and relationships. So Mercia, not only economically but socially, was connected to these kingdoms and needed to control and manage the relationships with these kingdoms. So as well as raiding into Wales, there's a broader backdrop there. And I think that's why it's important, this, this, this southern end of what Stike is really important, where it hits the... Uh, Morda Brook, and then may have continued to the Vanwy via Lower Morton from Maysbury. And Fox makes the argument, but it was not convinced that maybe this is almost like a canal in this lowland landscape. And Worthington examined a crop mark south of Montgomery Canal, which I'll show you, which he doesn't actually visualise it, just doesn't illustrate, um, which does show the possible extension to the confluence of the Morda and the Vanwy of Watts Dyke. And Hayes and Malin support that view. And here it is. So here we are looking past Lower Morton to Maysbury. And then there's Os um, Osrestry here and Old Osrestry Hillfort. And you can see this line kinking here and continuing as a crop mark from this aerial photograph by Chris Musson. And this may suggest that once it hits this lowland territory and it's no longer visible, what Stike may have continued far longer, right to the Vanwy. So it was connecting the D estuary to the Vanwy, which connected to the Severn. So along the line of what Stike, you can imagine, you could actually pursue a um, connections to the two main river systems that frame the Mercian Kingdoms, northwest and southwest corners, so to speak. So while it looks like just about controlling this region, this linear earthwork is actually locking together, connecting together, it may have continued right the way down here, the Vanwy with the D. The other point about Wattstike is that, as I've said in other lectures, is it overlooks rivers and streams. It controls the river valleys connecting them. It actually more so than Offers Dyke. So these purple sections of Offers Dyke are the sections where Offers Dyke overlooks rivers and it's actually not in this northern section it's actually not that much but what Stike does that job and together if they did it work together they create a, la a narrow channel in which movement is being controlled so here's some examples I've put onto modern ordnance survey maps the line of 
the supposed line of Watts Dyke if it had been continuous by Hollywell and here at Northup and you can see how it's using the ridges to dominate the valleys to its west strategically very carefully placed hence Fox argued about a military mind and while it's a, a hash line here because we don't really know exactly where it goes um, this is the confluence of the Kerryog and the Dee showing us how the ridge tops may have been utilised by Watts Dyke to dominate the, the river valleys. Linked to that, Watts Dyke seems to be much more intelligent or careful about how many rivers it had to block. And in this map, where there may have been key strategic locations, dams, bridges, perhaps gates to la on the land side, Watts Dyke is blocking the landscape, controlling movement, and actually there's a far fewer number of connections here than, than Office Dyke has to face. In this northern section, Office Dyke has a real tough job jumping between different streams. It's blocking in this upland stance it's taking, whereas Watts Dyke has an easier job blocking the major, I've put larger circles to the major rivers. The Allen, which isn't that big, but it's a major route. The Dee and the Kerryog here only two major routes, um, rivers, are being blocked in the whole course uh, and protecting the D to its back. Whereas Offers Dyke has only two major rivers to cross, the Kerryog and the D. Watts Dyke does it as one point, um, but it also has to cut across the runway itself. So here's the line of Watts Dyke where it cuts across various rivers but does so strategically such as the Clywedog here at Wrexham um, where it follows along the top of the ridge. Another thing that Watts Dyke does is run into hill forts and some people have seen this as coincidence or simply a practical utilisation of key landmarks but um, following the arguments of Sarah Semple and others about early medieval site locations and monument locations, there is still scope for seeing this as a deliberate appropriation of an ancient site, refortifying it and using it maybe as a site of assembly, mustering, and perhaps because the ancient monument had a symbolic significance for local people. So here's Watts Dyke running into old Oswestry Hill Fort, a, a Neolithic site that continues in use through the Bronze Age, or the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age, defences running around the hilltop, one of the premier hill forts of the Welsh borderlands. And Watts Dyke is running into it. So here on Fox's map, running in from the north, we presume it may have jumped up and followed around the second line of defences on the north side and the lowest line of defences on the south before then heading off, changing orientation and dropping down through what became the town of Oswestry. At the northern end, um, the dyke goes very close to the later holy well of St Winifred's. Uh, and into the site that was going to become a Cistercian Abbey. Now we have no actual categorical evidence there was anything going on in this Greenfield Valley, Valley in the early Middle Ages before Watts Dyke. And this is a stretch of what is Watts Dyke, although um, some archaeologists don't believe it. They think it's just a path. I think we have surviving here um, Watts Dyke dropping down uh, from the Strand Fields into Wards, Basingwork, and there's Holy Well. Um, I think we, you know, if this was anywhere else on Offers Dyke, that would be demonstrably Offers Dyke. It looks exactly the same as Offers Dyke does in the Y Valley, for example. Now, by doing that, my point is that there may have been an earlier set of holy sites in this valley, sacred sites, Christian sites that were associated with this valley. This valley had strategic significance, controlling the Flintshire coast, but it may have been a sacred site, and I would suggest that. Watts Dyke, both at sites like Old Oswestry, and not exclusively, there are other hill forts too, perhaps at Erthig, as Rachel Swallow has argued, perhaps at, um, well, undoubtedly at Kyre Allen or Bryn Allen Hill Fort in, in Wrexham, we have the reuse of these, these monuments in the line. So I'm saying this is a deliberate symbolic appropriation of site, uh, ancient sites. So... My, my my argument about the why of Watts Dyke is we still don't know its exact relationship with Offers Dyke, whether it was later or they were used contemporaneously as part of the same project. I still think Watts Dyke looks like it might be later. But whatever the precise dating, 
We're looking at a monument that's about controlling surveillance of the landscape, managing movement, connecting river systems and connecting the seas. The Bristol Channel via the Severn and the Dee estuary to the Irish Sea. And so I see it as a monument that's ideological, economic, but is about the relationship between the two, the economic and the ideological, in controlling this borderland landscape. Having surveyed what I think we know about um, Watts Dyke, there's still much that could be further investigated, more dating, more understanding sites in relation to it. There's much more work to be done and the fact that some public, some work has been done that hasn't been published fully is an added frustration and yet I think we're getting closer to an understanding of this monument. Not only as a, 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 a barrier in the landscape but as an ideological statement of mercy and kingship promoting and projecting and consolidating their power through its building and its use and perhaps also by its naming. The naming after Wade may have had significance within the Mercian dynasty as a way of honouring it as big enough to be a work of giants, a work of ancient heroes. So it's almost like giving a brand new monument an ancient name to antiquate it, to dedicate it. In my second half, that's about what Watts Dyke was like in the late 8th, early 9th century. But what's Watts Dyke today? Well, to answer that, I think we need another video. And I'll come on to that looking at the heritage and public archaeology of Watts Dyke. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed this Archeo Death video, why not check out the Archeo Death blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.